Cool morning guys, a very, very warm welcome this morning to Christchurch Tarhurst. If you're regular, if you're visiting, if you're newish, um, etc, etc, it's great that we can gather together. Uh, guys, do come and sit down, grab a seat, uh, and we're going to have uh, some great time together um, thinking about some of the amazing truths from God's Word, uh, singing some songs. So we're at Sunday school today, uh, which is great, so the children will head off uh, in about 25 minutes, half an hour or so and go and do a Bible lesson, which is great. And then this morning, uh, Alex Clayton is going, to, going to, is going to be continuing our series in Joshua. So for those of you uh, that can vaguely recall, uh, I opened the series uh, in the beginning of December, and then we'll be, um, uh, uh, Alex will be speaking in Joshua to a bit later on today, uh, just so you know where we're going. Um, if you, when you came in, you might have been given one of these bad boys, a bit of paper, a lot of information. I'm not really going to repeat anything. Uh, you can read through the detail there. Uh, one thing I will just going to flag attention to, just because it's really, really exciting, is that on Sunday the 23rd of January, uh, instead of having a morning service, we're essentially moving our morning service so that the baptismal service in the afternoon will be our main gathering of the day, Okay, which is a really exciting thing to do. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, so that, that's just worth flagging, I think, specifically. Okay, great. Um, right, something I normally do, which is maybe a bit bonkers, is I normally start by a service by praying, but I like to not know what to pray for, because just to keep people on their toes. But I have this. Who remembers these? Did you remember these? Who wants to come and uh, pick a dipper word out of here? Uh, I should have a, like, a, a register who does this each time. Because often they were screaming and crying children at the end. Okay. Um, Zahara, why didn't you come up? Um, Isabel, why didn't you come up? Uh, do we have a boy as well? Jess, actually Barney, why didn't you come up? Is that okay? So we've got three. Sorry if you didn't get a chance, guys. Come up and... Oh, we've got four. Isabel, brilliant. Come... Oh, I said Isabel. We've got two Isabels this morning. How confusing. Isabel, welcome. Isabel, welcome. Right, should we have the Isabels go first? Pick out one of those. Anyone you like. Anyone you like, what's it going to be? I don't know. If it's really hard, then I'll be in trouble. Right, hold on to it, hold on to it. Oh, Isabel, oh, you've got two there. Can you get one? Oh, which one do you want? That one there, brilliant. Funny. Oh, here we go. Sahara. Excellent. Okay. So let's find out some amazing things about God. And this is going to tell us what we're going to have about. Who should go first? You know what? Let's go. Who's the youngest? I think probably Isabel. So what does your one say, Isabel? <gasps> it says, Jesus is the lamb. That's a bit interesting. I thought Jesus was a man. I didn't think Jesus was a sheep. But just like um, the reason that we say Jesus is the lamb is because um, Jesus had to die a sacrifice on the cross. Just like uh, a lamb had to sacrifice. That's a bit of a complicated one, actually. In the, in the Old Testament, when God's people were being saved from God's judgment, God had to send a sacrificial lamb. So we can thank you that God sent Jesus to be the sacrifice. Thank you, Isabel. That's really helpful. Right, should we have the other Isabel, just to confuse things? And you, you can might be able to even read your one out. Do you reckon you read what it's in the white bit? What did it say? That is really excellent reading. So this says, save his people from their sins. And that's exactly what the sacrifice was for. Jesus was a sacrifice to save us from our sins. So we can pray, thank God for that. Thank you, guys. Should we go to Mr. B? Is that your name? Barnaby. Barnaby. Sorry, not Mr. B. Your one says, the Lord God of truth. This tells us, that everything that God says and does is true. That's great, isn't it? He never lies, so we can always trust him. And we've got one more. Sahara. Do you reckon you can read, what is that? Do you know that one it says? What about that one there, those two words? I am. This says God is I am. That means we can know about who God is and what God is like when we look at him and see everything that he does. But when he is powerful and strong and loving, that is how we know what God is like. We just look at him because we understand him because of who he is. Fantastic. You guys want to go and sit down? 
And we're going to pray to start our time this morning. At home, we do a little action to help us pray and not fidget. Ready, Zach? How do we do it? We do this, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. It's a bit like the Macarena, but not the Macarena. Right, let's pray. And I'm going to remember these. We're going to say, God, thank you that you are the best. And that just by looking at you and all that you've done, we can know how amazing you are. And thank you that you are the Lord of truth. That everything you do and everything you say is true. That is amazing, so we can trust you. And thank you that you sent Jesus to save people from their sins. The sins that are in all of us. The sins that mean we can't be friends with you. But because Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, he died on the cross in our place. If we trust in him, we can be friends with Jesus. Thank you that we can remember all these amazing truths this morning. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much. I, I've just looked up after looking down at the kids, and I think we've got doubled in people. So excellent stuff. Um, good stuff. Cool. Right. Who thinks there should be more sweets? Involved in the Sunday morning service. Well, there's a few people like David here who's like hand straight up. That's brilliant. Right, okay. So I thought, I put them down somewhere. I thought we could have some jelly babies. Who wants a jelly baby this morning? Okay, I need a super responsible helper. Who is, who, children, can you all point to who you think the most sensible adult is in the room? Three, two, one, go. It's, it's my wife. Rachel is the most responsible adult wife. Rachel, can you come and uh, make sure every child, hopefully there's enough in here, gets a jelly baby. But one, one thing to remember, listen carefully, super extra carefully, you mustn't eat it yet. You can eat it in a minute when I say so. Just hold on to it. Don't eat it yet. Okay? Okay, just wait. Hold on to it. Cool. There's a lot of responsibility riding on this. Okay. Uh, excellent. I've got my own. I've got my own packed lunchbox of jelly babies right here. Um, so could I, I get to eat six because I'm just really special. Really That's not true. Excellent. Um, something Alex said actually on Christmas Day, and he sometimes says you know things that are worth remembering. Um, he said. Something that I found really, really helpful when we were just kind of chatting about Christmas. And he said, um, sometimes God uses really ordinary things like rainbows, like um, well, all sorts of things in the Bible, doesn't he? God just uses it like flowers and birds um, to help us understand some amazing things about God. Now, jelly babies are quite ordinary things, aren't they? But we are going to learn some amazing things about Jesus and God this morning, using jelly babies. Right, I think most people have got a jelly baby now. Put your hand in the air if you've got a black jelly baby. Who's got a black one? I don't know how many there are, so there might just be one. Else. Who's got a black one? I, I can see that Sophia's got a black one. Anyone else got a black one? Okay, right, so Sophia, you're allowed to eat yours, but not yet. Get your black one. This is a bit tricky. Right. Give it a lick on the front. All right. All right. What can you... There's a special shape on his tummy. Can you see what shape's on the tummy? A heart. A heart. Brilliant. Right. That's just going to be a bowl of sticky... Right. So here we go. Jelly baby. Oh, this is going to be terrible, isn't it? Hang on a minute. Why are you laughing at my drawing? <laughs> Hard. Okay, fantastic. So, if you've got a black jelly baby, you're allowed to eat it. Okay, who has got... Put your hand in the air and wave it at me if you've got a green jelly baby. Who's got a green jelly baby? Okay, I think there might be a couple over here. Right, give it a lick. Lick, lick his face. <laughs> And what's he doing? What's, is he? And why do you think he's rubbing his eye? Because he just got out of bed. Maybe he's actually 
Who's crying? Who's, oh, you, I'm sorry, Jesse. I was looking that way. I didn't see you over there, mate. That's right. He's crying. Right, if you've got a green one, pop it in your mouth. You can eat it. I haven't got all the different white colour pens, by the way. So we're just going to have to go with this. So here we go. Um, that is a, that's basically a really good jelly baby. Let's draw a lovely tear. That's a, kind of a tear. And we'll put cry. I've not thought about the amount of space I'm using here. Right, who's got a red one? Who's got a red one? Give it a lick. Let's give it a lick. Is there anything there? There is a letter on his tongue. Anyone see the letter? What's the letter? Who's got it? Georgia, have you got a red one? What, can you see the letter on the front? What letter is it? It's a B! Brilliant! If you've got a red one, guess what you can do now? Eat it. You can eat it! Right, right, who's got a pink one? There is a pink! I've got a pink one. Who's got a, who's got a pink one? Has no one else got a pink one? Did you? Who, <laughs> shocking. I bet, I bet Neil got a pink one, and I bet he couldn't wait, and I bet he ate it. That's the sort of thing Neil would do, isn't it? Well, you know what it is? I'll, I'll give it a lick. It is a baby. Pink one's a baby. So I'll do it in red again, over here. So I'll do a little baby one. All right, baby. There is a point to this, by the way, grown up. Um, right, who's got a... <gasps> There's two colours left. Yellow! I think, yeah, who's got yellow one? I've got yellow one. Who's got yellow? There were definitely some yellows in the pack. Okay. Go! Pippin's got a yellow! Go, cool. Pippin, give it a lick. And... It's a bit hard to see. But what's he got round his neck, or what's she got round her neck? You might not be able to figure it out. Yeah, who said that? Was that Becky? Well done, excellent. So here we go, here we go. Here we go. That's actually a yellow one, not blue. Right, so who hasn't yet been, who's not been allowed to eat their jelly baby yet? What colour is it? Orange. <laughs> what have I done? Oh, Nick Lass. Oh my word. Oh my word. This happened last time, do you remember? With like, um, what was it I did? A beach and beach. That's fine though, because they are necklaces. Exactly, exactly. It's all, I, Penny is probably like screaming inside at this point. Right, I'm no longer allowed to like write on the board. I'm so embarrassed. Like, I'm so dyslexic. It's like not even funny. But it is funny. But um, the orange. I lick the orange one, and he's got something on his tummy. What do you think could be around his tummy, around his waist? Anyone got any ideas? Mm -hmm. It. Anyone want to have a guess what's around the orange one's waist? Belt. Yeah, we can put it a belt. I want to put a belt or a bag. Okay, cool. If you haven't eaten your jelly baby yet, you can eat your jelly baby, that's fine. Okay, guys, so why did I get some jelly babies out? Well, actually, jelly babies tell us the story of the gospel, the story of the Bible about Jesus. Are you ready for this? Watch really carefully. The black one is black because we have sin in our hearts. We've got sin in our heart. We know there are bad things, don't we? We know there are bad things and sad things. That's because just like when we have, we have a cough, and we've got germs in our body, we, the bad and sad things happen because we have sin in our heart. And that is sad, isn't it? I'll write the word sad here. It's sad, it would make God want to cry, makes us want to cry, makes other people cry. Our sin is sad, isn't it? Just like that green jelly baby. But... I've lost my pens, so I'll just have to go with it. 
The red one has got a B on his tummy, and that stands for this word, blood. It was the blood of Jesus on the cross when he died to take away our sins if we trust in him, that we can be friends with God again. So the red one reminds us of the red blood that was paid so that we could be friends with God again. And when, if we say to Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, I'm sad, I want to trust in Jesus, then it's like we're born again, like a baby. It's like we're, well, a new life starts with Jesus. It's like we have a new life, and that's really, really exciting. And when we trust in Jesus, do you know what we get? We get treasure, just like the gems and jewels on a necklace, diamond. And what that treasure is, is to be with God forever in heaven, where there is no bad and there is no sad ever. And on the way now, we need a belt or a bag. It's a bit like a journey, isn't it, starting now? I decided to follow Jesus when I was 18 years old. And now I'm on a journey, if you like, to be with God forever in heaven. And so I've got God with me, with a belt and a bag, to guide me there all the way. So there we go. Next time you have a jelly baby, you can think, and you, it can teach you and remind you all about Jesus and the gospel. There we go. Fantastic stuff. We're going to invite the band up now. And we're going to sing a couple of songs. We're going to sing, firstly, a song about while we were still God's enemies and sinners, God gave us his son to die on the cross. And then we're going to think about that Jesus is coming back, that he's going to come back, and we're going to know that treasure, and all that sadness and bad will be taken away. While the band just uh, thought themselves out, um, I'm just going to read a verse from the book of Romans, uh, and chapter 5 and verse 6, and it says this, it says, see, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Ready? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Brilliant. Chris, uh, Rachel, Carrie, the Lucy Street leaders. Let's stand and sing.
to that, the children will go out to Sunday school. While we were, while we, while we were sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross that we might be friends with you if we say sorry for our sin, trust in Jesus Christ, and commit our lives to be one of following him. And thank you that one day you will make all things right, all things good, when you come back. Amen. Guys, if you're in Team Sunday School, uh, why not head out? See you guys in a little bit later. Um, if you're not in Team Sunday School, feel free to uh, just wave at your neighbour. Uh, I'll have a couple of minutes just while we wait for the Sunday school to depart. Great. 
stuff. Um, we'll have a time of prayer, um, just to just to reflect, just to pray for those in our congregation uh, that have various needs, um, and then after that, uh, Rachel will read the scriptures uh, and then Alex will preach. But uh, let's just come together, just a moment of quiet, maybe twenty or thirty seconds. Maybe pray by yourself. Uh, maybe pray something you've just reflected on this morning or sung. Uh, to praise God, and then I will lead us collectively in maybe 30 seconds time. Father God, thank you that you are so great, that we gather this morning, um, whereby the thing that ties us all together, really, the one commonality that we all have is that we're sinners. Uh, but Lord, you have made a way in your deep love and mercy and grace towards us, you sent your son, Jesus Christ that he came to earth to reveal your amazing character and self to us it, it just so fully and amazingly and that Lord you sent your son not just to reveal yourself but on a rescue mission on a mission to sacrifice himself as a lamb by dying on the cross and in doing so you poured out Father your just judgment on sin on him instead of us so Lord if we are here this morning if we've trusted in Christ if we've repented of our sins if we know him as our saviour and friend and Lord then we can know the deep comfort deep joy that our sins are forgiven even the ones that we've committed just moments ago even the ones that we're going to commit in moments to come they are all dealt with at the cross of Jesus and Lord, we pray for those here this morning that are maybe unsure about these things. Uh, even those in Sunday school that are still learning and unsure about these things. We pray, Lord, that you would impress upon them just the, the glory of salvation in Christ. Uh, the treasure that awaits them uh, if they trust and repent and, and turn to Jesus. Lord, thank you that you are a God who is a helper and a comforter. That you are uh, a God that knows every hair on our head. You are a God that is sovereign over every breath that we take, over every cell of DNA that are in our body. And Lord, thank you that that gives us hope, it gives us peace, it reminds us that we have a great God who is in control. And Lord, we are such a needy bunch of people, Lord, because we are broken, because we are sinful, and we experience the effects of that in our lives, Lord, whether that be illness, whether that be uh, just relational suffering, maybe it's difficulties at work, maybe it's just growing old, but Lord, you are with us in every moment of our life. Thank you, Father. We pray for some specifics. We pray for Anita. Thank you that she's now home. Thank you that she, after the shock of the news, she's been able to, to rejoice in your goodness and your sovereignty and that you continue to uphold her, that she would know uh, your uh, she would know your hand, she would know your fatherly comfort in a way that she's never experienced before. We pray for Clive and this is tested positive for COVID, that you would keep him well and strong and for the whole family, Lord, that you would undertake it for them, that they would, they would this would be Something that is for their good, even though we don't see that from, just from our, our purely human eyes. But we pray for Mary Derrick, who I know is, um, I think, got an operation uh, on the 17th of January. She was diagnosed with breast cancer before, before Christmas. Lord, we pray that the same will be true of her and indeed Stephen, um, that you would uphold them and, and her in her frailty, and that, Lord, she as a warrior of prayer, 
that she often talked about, Lord, she would just be even more so dependent on your goodness uh, and crying out to you, uh, even from her kind of hospital bed. And Lord, we pray for Julia as well, uh, who's going into an off on Friday. Uh, Lord, that you would undertake for her, that she would know uh, just a, an overwhelming sense of your peace uh, and support as she goes through that, especially as it's on her birthday, Lord, that she might be able to rejoice in your goodness despite uh, this, this kind of surgery. Lord, we pray for our Sunday school now, that the Sunday school teachers would teach the gospel powerfully and helpfully. Lord, we pray for us as we read your word. Speak to us, Father. Speak to us. Speak to Alex, that we would be refreshed in the goodness and grace of, of our Saviour, that we be reminded of the strength and uh, that, that you are a God who longs and works in your people to deliver us from slavery and sin to freedom uh, and salvation. Uh, Lord, may Alex refresh us and that you would use him powerfully in his words and his prep, empower his words by your spirit even now this morning, Father, uh, that we would go out from here uh, not knowing something about Jesus and God more, but feeling that a bit more, with, with a, an earnest desire to live for you more, uh, to, to share our lives and Jesus more with our colleagues, our friends, Lord, and more strengthened in our faith. But Lord, when we are uh, tempted to doubt or to sin, you might even point us back to the truth Alex reminded us of this morning, that we would stand firm in the truth of your amazing character of the amazing power of the Spirit that you have poured out upon us and in the glory of salvation we have in Christ. So be with us now, we ask in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Cool. Rachel's going to come up um, for the second time, the most trustworthy person we have, apparently, and is going to read Joshua 2, the whole of Joshua 2. It's a well-known passage um, from kind of like a Sunday school classic. Uh, it's a passage of Rahab the prostitute. Um, when sort of the spies go into Jericho. Um, so do turn to it, Joshua chapter 2. Uh, it's sort of half, it's a, sort of towards the beginning ish of the Old Testament. Um, if you've got to like Isaiah or Psalms, you've gone too far. If you're still in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, keep going a bit further. Um, great. Over to you. And then, Alex, why don't you come up immediately? Um, let me gather my gear. Go for it. Joshua chapter 2. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you. 
hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Just uh, take a second to sort myself out, but uh, please do keep uh, Joshua chapter 2 open. I'm sure it'll be really useful. Um, I'll just get this. Okay, well, we're coming to our second uh, message from the book of Joshua, um, and uh, yeah, as Graham mentioned, we started it uh, about a month ago, and we'll be coming back to it about once a month, because we've got this preaching group set up, so there's a few of us guys who are going to be working our way through this book intermittently. And, you know, it's a simple idea to have this little preacher's group, it's... Um, uh, just us getting together, looking at the passage, uh, helping each other in, in developing the messages that we might prepare together. Uh, but well, I, I'm quite excited about the idea, uh, and although it's not particularly clever or ingenious or anything, I, I hope it will achieve a few things for us as a church. You know, I'm, I'm really hoping that it's going to be helpful for us as a group of guys, because we're getting together, we're, we're studying God's Word together, uh, and we're encouraging each other in this ministry. So that's got to be a good thing, right? Um, but my hope is there will be a blessing to the church as well, that you know, there'll be a, a wider range of voices heard from the front, which I think must be a, a positive thing, um, a, a chance to look through another book of the Scriptures, and it's a chance also for the, the church to encourage the guys who are participating, because... Uh, so I, I would encourage you, after the, someone gives a sermon, do, do in, give them some positive feedback. Do go and encourage them in that. Uh, and also, I hope it's actually going to really benefit Dan, because he gets to participate, but also it provides like, a regular cadence of like, breaks and things in his own preaching uh, programme, which I think will hopefully uh, help him uh, and just ease the load there a little bit. So... You know, nothing too smart, but I like it because it hits a few uh, targets, hopefully. Um, and actually, something that I've really come to admire as I've uh, come to look at Joshua 2 is how God has... There's one story here, yeah, this dramatic story that we've just read. But God seems to be hitting a number of targets with it. He has great plans. And uh, we get to see God delivering his people, but uh, different peoples, different times and spaces. Uh, and I really admire that about this passage. So we're going to look at, at God as the deliverer of his people Israel, as the deliverer of this foreign sinner, Rahab. And we'll also see actually how he's sowing the seeds of our deliverance also. Uh, I'm sure you're aware, but when I use the word deliverer, think rescuer rather than parcel force. Uh, I know that we've been receiving a lot uh, over Christmas and probably thought from time to time, my deliverer is here in his DPD van. Uh, but um, no, we're, we're looking more at rescue. Although both people get things where they need to go, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that's what we'll be considering about the Lord this morning. So, as Graham introduced, Joshua is a book 
about God delivering on his promises. Uh, he made big, big promises to Abraham, to Moses, and this is where we see them happen. And it's so exciting for that. And Moses was the great leader of Israel, but Joshua is now his successor. He's, a, he's kind of a new Moses in many ways. And we'll see, actually, as we go through the book of Joshua, many similarities between what happened in the Exodus with, under Moses' leadership and what is going to happen uh, under Joshua. Um, and Joshua actually starts this chapter by doing something similar to what Moses did back in Numbers 13. He sends spies into this land to scope it out. So in, in verse 1 here, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now you might know what happened when Moses sent out the spies. It wasn't the best of expeditions. Moses sent out 12 spies. Ten of them came back and said, Whoa, the people in the land are huge. They're like gladiators or something. They're ferocious. Like, there's no way we can take the land. And Joshua, as it happens, was one of only two spies who came back and said, God is with us. We can take them. But those ten and the response of the people showed that they were not yet ready to take the land. And so God actually said to Moses, you and this generation are not going to go into the land except for Joshua uh, and, and Caleb, who will, who, who will lead the people in. Otherwise, it's for the next generation. So here's Joshua, he's about to take the land, he sends spies in, uh, but he's learned from Moses' mistakes a little bit. Rather than send 12 people and have 10 no good nicks come back and report badly, he just sends two decent guys, all right? So he's cut, cut the chaff and he's sent two guys in. But they, maybe they're not actually that great as spies because they seem to be caught almost immediately. Uh, maybe they come from like the James Bond school of spying where... Uh, you know, he's a secret agent, but famously introduces himself in full wherever he goes, uh, and everybody seems to recognize him. And sure enough, here in verse 2, uh, just after their arrival, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. So they've hardly arrived, and already the jig is up. They, they, they've been caught, and they've got nowhere to hide but in this local woman's house. But, amazingly, this local woman helps them. In fact, she covers for them from verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of, Jordan, of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Pretty crafty manoeuvre, isn't it? And um, uh, not only does she actually protect the spies, but it seems like these guys are shut out of the city, so they're going to be roughing it for a few days. Um, and so, but, uh, and then, uh, so the, spy, the spies then have a chat with Rahab, and we'll come back to exactly what is said in a bit, but the spies need to make their exit still uh, from the city, uh, and so if we skip over to verse 15, then we see the cunning plan uh, that they come up with. So, she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. So pretty daring escape from the city, wasn't it? I can only imagine it would look something like that. Uh, so, yeah, pretty impressive stuff. Maybe, maybe actually that's a bit glamorous. Maybe it was more like that. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm sure the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, but uh, but, but they, they escape. They hide out for three days, and then they manage to get back to Joshua. Verse 22, when they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. I mean, that must have been quite a campfire story, mustn't it? Uh, what, how they'd had this brush with death, 
uh, I wonder how that conversation would have gone and, and exactly what they might have said. You might have expected them to come back to Joshua and say, we barely made it out alive. We were terrified. We, we just relied on this woman who we had no right to think would help us uh, and yet here we are by the skin of our teeth. I am not going back there. <laughs> but they don't say that at all. And actually, what one comment, all they say is, verse 24, they say, or at least this is what we've got recorded, they said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. One commentator, Dale Ralph Davis, who has an excellent commentary on, on Joshua, I hi, highly recommend it. Uh, he makes a slightly cheeky observation that they don't seem to have gathered much military intelligence here, do they, when they report back. And you can imagine the conversation with Joshua where Joshua's like, so uh, what can you tell us about Jericho? Uh, any, any weaknesses? Maybe weaknesses in the walls or anything? Like, well, there's a window that we climbed out of. Like, that's about all we know. Uh, any changing of the guards or anything? Well, I don't know. It takes them about three days to walk down that road when they're looking for someone. It's not great, is it, in terms of uh, intelligence that we, we have relayed to them. But actually, that's kind of the point. Because they didn't need to go and scout out the land for any strategy, for any great tactics or anything. What they needed to know was that God was with them. And this whole episode assured them of that. In fact, it's the very opposite of where the spies under Moses went wrong. Because they came back and they reported about all the people that they saw. They said, these guys are huge, we can't possibly fight them. Whereas these two, they came back and reported on their God and how the Lord was surely going to deliver on his promises. He had delivered them, and, he saw, and they were encouraged to see a people who uh, had, had lived in fear, even, of their God. And I find that tremendously encouraging. And, uh, and when I think back to, say, Graham's message on Joshua 1, and this instruction that when was given to Joshua from God to be strong and courageous, and you kind of think, oh, how? I make myself strong and courageous. Well, here just seems to be a good case study of that. You see, these guys, they, they didn't go in and just see the scale of the problem. No, they saw the might of their deliverer as well. And that's an attitude that I really want to cultivate in my life, and, and I pray that we might be able to uh, as a church and in our own life. Whenever we see problems or difficulties around us, then may we see... God, our deliverer, as well. You know, if I'm struggling at work, if I'm suffering with that fear of men that Pierre so helpfully uh, talked to us about last week, then may I remember that God loves me more than the birds of the air, and he provides for them. When I'm fearful of sharing my faith, then may I remember that God's word does not return to him void. May I see my deliverer as well, and trust him. Whatever circumstances may come, I am in his care. You know, Dan's been making me a bit nervous over the last couple of weeks, which, uh, I don't know, I'm just thinking, is that usually true of Dan? Probably not, no, I think that would be unfair. But, uh, but he's been sending out some emails, uh, not just to me, you, you, many of you will have had them, about uh, a Passion for Life ministry this year. Uh, and it's, uh, it, the idea is that nationwide, churches are going to kind of um, uh, have a, a, a concerted effort in their outreach to the nation around. And you know, there's a bit of me inside that when I read those messages, just begins to kind of tremble a little bit. You know, and I think, am I ready for this? Uh, is the church ready for this? I don't know. Like, we've gone through so much change as a church recently uh, over the last couple of years. And I, I think we're perhaps bit vulnerable in many ways, like we know that there's so much sickness and people going through hard times and so forth. Maybe just now isn't the time. But actually, what I want to remember is whatever may come with that, however valid those concerns or other fears in our lives, the success of something like that is not going to be determined by my strength. It's not going to be determined by the size of the opposition. It's going to be determined by the will of God, our mighty deliverer. And that's what the spies recognized. And they knew the will of God there because God had promised them the land. And so they could come back and earnestly report that the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. 
pretty amazing deliverance of the spies, isn't it? And, and indeed the deliverance, therefore, of Israel into the promised land, which we'll continue to see through Joshua. But actually, I'm not sure that's the most amazing story of deliverance in this passage. I think that, uh, that prize has to go to Rahab. You see, Rahab is exactly the sort of person who should have been utterly kicked out of this land, um, uh, uh, if not eliminated completely. I mean, she was totally immoral. She was a prostitute. Not to mention that she was of completely the wrong ethnicity. She, she wasn't a Jew. And these should have been enormous problems for the Jews as they came into this land. But what she does have is faith. And that's seen in her conversation with the spies. And, you know, sometimes uh, faith, I think, can seem like an ab abstract concept. But actually, let's look at what Rahab say, says here. If you're confused, maybe, about, or you, you've sometimes been confused, what is faith? Do I have faith? I, it, it, what, what does that even look like? Um, that, then, actually, let's look at her words here, because faith is really just recognising who God is and how that, what that means to you, the implications on your life. So have a look at verse 8, then, when she starts this conversation with them. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear of you. You see, so right away, Rahab's words show that she recognises who God is. Specifically in this case, I think, that he is supreme, that he is Lord and judge, that he, he is going to exercise control over this land. She knows this because of what God has done in history. Verse 10, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. So she recognises this because of what God has done. She also recognises that this has implications on herself and those around her. Verse 11, when we heard of it, our hearts sank and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. But she also recognises that she has hope because God is her only possible deliverer. Verse 12, now then please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. What an amazing confession of faith this is, isn't it? And it results, obviously, in action. She's protected the spies, uh, uh, and she's going to follow their instructions that we'll see in a minute. And so if you doubt your faith, or maybe you've never been in a position of faith yourself, then maybe just consider... Uh, Rahab's example here. You know, we, the Christians have faith in the same God as Rahab had faith in. And actually, in similar characteristics to those identified here, simply recognising that God is Lord and Judge in our lives, we can see that because he has worked in history and we have the Bible here to tell us of it. We should recognise the implications on ourselves, that we can live under judgement or we can turn to God as our deliverer as he has promised us deliverance through Jesus Christ. And what happens when someone demonstrates such faith? Well, you might have expected the spies to hear this and say, well, that's fantastic, Rahab, but this is a bit awkward, but you're a prostitute, that's not really very eligible, I'm afraid, to join our, our people, or... I'm afraid we're only accept accepting Jewish applicants right now. Um, no, they don't say any such thing, though, do they? No, their acceptance is wholehearted. Verse 14, our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what, what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. You might think, well, there's just some quid pro quo here. But actually, then from verse 17, they, they give her these instructions, which are just amazing, really, in, in their nature, because one of the things that really defines the Jewish people at this point in their history was the Passover, their escape from slavery in Egypt, 
And uh, you know, you may well know the story. So um, the, in order to escape Egypt, God's judgment was going to come upon the nation. The firstborn were going to die. Uh, but the Jews were safe when they painted the blood of a sacrificed lamb on the door thing. It, it was great to hear that uh, Jesus described as a lamb as the very first uh, dipper that came out uh, today. And uh, so they would put this blood of the lamb uh, on the door frame, and that, dem- that visible sign of their faith uh, would be seen by the angel of death, and, uh, and they would be delivered through the, this judgment. And th- just have that in mind, and let's read what um, Rahab is told to do in verse 17 onwards. The men said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us, unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window. Through which, you, through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head. If the hand is laid on him, but if... It, sorry. His, as for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing... We will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. You see the similarity. So here's uh, judgment is going to sweep through Jericho. Not in the angel of death this time, but in uh, the form of the Israelite army. Uh, And she is to take refuge in this house and put a red sign of her faith in God's promise on the window frame. And all who are under that protection, uh, under that faith, will be delivered. She effectively has her own mini Passover here. And it doesn't really get much more Jewish, in a sense, than that, being part of God's people. Her acceptance is absolute. It doesn't matter that she uh, had such an immoral background. It doesn't matter that she was the wrong ethnicity. What matters is that she was a person of faith, and that is what makes her one of God's people. And that's always been the way. Paul goes uh, pains to, uh, to talk about this in the book of Romans, and I, I would commend Romans 4 to you. I, I won't turn to it now, uh, just for, uh, I, I don't want to kind of spread ourselves too thin. But, um, but there we, we see that a- Abraham was saved not by his, who he was, not by his ethnicity, not by his works, his morality, but by faith in God. It has always been that God's true people are those who have faith in him. So even Rahab, the, mo- the least likely of people, is fully and completely accepted. In fact, so much so that in Hebrews 11, there's this amazing chapter in Hebrews 11, um, where all the people of, uh, well, not all, but, you know, there's a great big list uh, of people of faith and their, their fantastic deeds that they have done in the name of their faith and in the name of the Lord. And Rahab is listed right in there with everyone else. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And the, the conclusion, uh, the, the summary that the, the writer of the Hebrews has about such people of faith, Hebrews eleven thirty eight, the world was not worthy of them. To think that those words could be spoken of Rahab is just phenomenal, isn't it? I could only imagine that she would weep at the, uh, with joy to have thought such a thing was possible of her. And I find that tremendously encouraging. That no matter how rubbish I may feel I am, my acceptance before God can be absolute. Even in church, you know, sometimes it can be quite difficult to fit into a church. Uh, uh, and yet, it doesn't really matter how much uh, we may struggle in our communities. What we need to know is that God accepts us, not to diminish those struggles. You know, sometimes you may come to church and you may feel that you just don't belong here. Maybe you feel just too sinful to be accepted here. You, you've got maybe some sort of public sin in your past. Maybe you, you struggle with something obvious like addiction or something like that that you, you just don't like people to be able to see and know about. Or maybe it's something more hidden that you're not the little miss or Mr. Perfect that you feel you ought to be in the church. 
Or maybe you feel you don't fit in for some other reason. Your, your background just doesn't seem to fit for some reason. Uh, you're, the, you're the wrong ethnicity. You're the wrong religion. You've come from a Muslim background, some Catholic orthodoxy, whatever it may be. Uh, and you just don't belong in a people like this. Or even within sort of more familiar church circles. And sometimes we feel points of friction, don't we? Uh, we? We might feel that we're too charismatic for the congregation or not charismatic enough or with the wrong class, wrong accent, wrong education, whatever it may be. And we can see these struggles and these points of friction. But what I want us to be encouraged by is that however the, the church should accept one another, but God will accept us when we come to him with faith. Because with God, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that salvation is absolute. There is no shame that can come into my life too tough for God to welcome me back. Because God is delivering his people. And if God was able to deliver Rahab, and for her to ultimately be described as someone of whom the world was not worthy, then I need not fear. And I can come to the Lord. So, God's delivering the Israelites. In this passage, he has this amazing deliverance of this foreign woman, Rahab. I want us just to consider as we close, very briefly as well, that God's actually sowing the seeds of our deliverance here as well. Uh, you can kind of zoom out from this passage and actually see that God, in this one passage, is showing us part of his plan for the whole of salvation history. You see, uh, Graham mentioned last time how Joshua, the book of Joshua, is delivering on God's promises for a promised land. And Jericho is only about 18 miles from Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. But he's also preparing a people and doing so in such a, a fantastic way. Uh, and this is something really interesting to the New Testament writers. In fact, Matthew opens his story of Jesus' life with a list of the, um, uh, of the family tree of Jesus. And in verse 5, it says, uh, listing um, uh, Jesus, Jesus' family line, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. So that makes Rahab something like the great-great-grandmother of, of King David. Again, isn't that just an exclamation mark on what we've considered so far? Again, Rahab, so fully accepted that she's actually part of the lineage of Jesus himself. But more than that, it shows that when God was delivering these spies, when God was delivering uh, Rahab, God was also preparing for your deliverance as well. He was laying that groundwork for the coming of Jesus Christ, for the salvation of you and me if we trust in him. I find that utterly mind-blowing, that Jesus, the Passover Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, has come because God accepted and rescued this foreign sinner. So let's marvel this morning at what God has done in his history, how he has delivered his people and how he fulfills all his promises. And we see that in the people of Israel. How no one, we can wonder the deliverance of Rahab and how no one is beyond God's grace. And we can worship the way that he, worship him for how he has brought, brought Jesus Christ into the world for our salvation. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you are a rescuer, uh, that you have rescued your people uh, time and again through history. And here we see how you have rescued your spies to whom you made promises. You rescue this foreign sinner who probably never knew that she could know you and yet was fully accepted uh, as she placed her faith in you. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for whom this passage prepares the way and Lord, we thank you that in him we can know our rescue from our sin as he died in our place. So Lord, we thank you and we pray that we would trust you. Where our faith is weak, uh, help us to turn to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm going to hand back to uh, the band now to close out the service.
Father, so much that we can rejoice this morning in such a strong deliverer, that is Jesus Christ. Lord, that he, or well, Father, that you have worked through the minutiae of history to bring about our salvation this morning, that we can rejoice in that. Lord, whatever situations we're going out into, may, knowing that it is you who makes us strong, it is you who deliver. May you lift our eyes up to the giver of life this week in our situations, knowing that it is you alone that can rescue, Lou alone that can save, you are our strength and our defender. And we want our lives to reflect that to the glory of Jesus Christ, our rescuer, our deliverer. Amen. Amen. Take a seat.